I know I'll be gone, and some people will still have recordings of my voice. Uh, I have recordings of people's voices on my phone who are gone. And I, I know I'm going to release the kids this minute, but I want you to hear me. Your voice is so important. Like when we sing songs like you heard a while ago about turn your face, what we want to hear is the voice of God. We want to hear him talk to us personally. And I can tell you that when David heard the voice of Samuel, it changed his life. It affected him. Voices are so, all through Scripture, you read about voices. His voice cried from the cross, and heaven heard it, and hell shuddered. A voice is powerful. 1991, I was preaching a youth camp in Mount Vernon, Illinois. And uh, I did not know the people I was actually preaching for. They had heard of me. And uh, so I went there to, uh, to, uh, to uh, preach, and, I was, and it was a rustic. You talk about our camp is five-star compared to that camp in Mount Vernon. We're talking about plywood walls, dirt floors. I mean, it was rough, no ACs. But I heard a voice in that camp, and when I did, God spoke to my heart. It was in 1991. He said, that's the voice of your pastor. Now, I had worked for people in my life in ministry. But I never really had somebody I called my pastor. And when I heard his voice, that was 30 years ago. And for 30 years, we've maintained relationship. You know I talk about him on Sunday morning. I talked to him on the way here. This morning, he sat beside me in the car, and I almost called him on my phone just so I'd feel normal. Amen. I'm so excited to have my pastor. You know, he's like daddy's in the house as far as I'm concerned. I appreciate his heart and passion for God. Amen. I want you to open up your hearts and prepare yourself for the Word of God. Would you welcome Pastor Mike Van Britson, Father's House, <laughs> Illinois. Pastor, it's an honor to be invited to be part of this 8th anniversary and uh, charity, my eldest. Wednesday night at midweek, she said, Dad, I'm glad you're going to see Pastor Jerry. Sure wish I could. She jumped into a vehicle when you had blood. We loaded the car with um, power washers and whatever you had said you wanted. She came down to work. My son Corey and Jennifer send their love and their prayers. You know, happy. Jessica and Jerry. Jerry, my son-in-law, is preaching today. Dave, uh, my son-in-law, is leading worship today. When you look at me, I'm the happiest man and then preacher on the earth. You can't be any happier than I am, but you can be as happy. We're honored to be here. I say those words a lot, but I mean them. Um, when we did get connected, you turned out to be the truest friend outside of my family that I've ever had. I love you. And my journey has been easier because you've been alongside me. So I thank you. And I'd like to start and establish a foundation for the message that the Lord gave me this morning, for this morning. I want to tell you about E. Stanley Jones. He was a dynamic preacher who was effective all across the world, but majorly in India. Now, he preached up until he was 87 years old, kept up a rigorous and active life. It's estimated that he preached more than 60,000 sermons, sometimes five to seven sermons a day. In 1971, after a strenuous two months of speaking 154 times in Japan, he suffered a stroke. And after several months in rehab, the hospitals and the doctors could not bring any improvement to him, so he asked. This is important about what God laid on my heart as your key speaker for this 18th anniversary for several services. What he did is what I'm asking you to do in cooperation with myself, with your pastor, with Pastor David, with Pastor Joseph and their families. 
that we would cooperate and agree together that God can do anything that he's promised to do if he can find some folks who would agree and say, this is my desire. And so E. Stanley Jones said, hey, look, I want to go back home to India. And the doctors concurred, and they said, there's nothing we can do for him. He's going to die soon. Now, upon his arrival uh, in India, he called for a band of believers that had been one to faith in Jesus Christ through his preaching and through his witness. This elderly, soon-to-die sick preacher asked for their help, and this is what he asked. I ask that you would agree with me, that you would declare God's word into my ear every morning. Come in early in the morning, and each one of you come in one at a time on the different particular days and whisper into my my ear Psalm 118, verse 17. And they came in and they whispered, You shall not die. You shall live and declare the works of the Lord. Came in day after day. I don't know the time period. The East Stanley Jones revived, regained his mobility and his ability to preach, and he preached 50 more sermons before he died about a year later. But my point for sharing that is God said that if we desire something in his word, you can have what you desire. And if two of you would agree as touching anything, he said it'll be done for you. Now in John chapter 15, I'm sorry, yeah, John chapter 15, verse 7 and 8. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask. Ask whatever you wish or desire, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And I ask myself in prayer for this church and for Pastor Jerry several months ago when he asked me to come and I got before the Lord and I started asking him, what is it you want me to say? What, what is it? What should my desire be to believe for? And I realized that to know him is our ultimate joy. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say in the little country church? And I thought of those Greeks who came to Philip and they paid a visit to him. And he was from Bethsaida, the Bible says, and they asked him, Philip, we wish to see Jesus. Boom, just like that, in my heart, there came a fire that activated my prayer for these special meetings. I said, that's it. That's what you're saying to me, Lord, that the desire for this 18th anniversary is that we would see Jesus, we would know Jesus, we would feel his presence, he would impact us during these special meetings. And so I I agreed in prayer. So we want to hear you. We want to feel your presence. And, and I thought about what the blessing and what the anointing and what grace and what a favor is. And I went to Isaiah chapter 61. And this defines whenever I say God wants to bless you, whenever I say during these meetings that the anointing of God wants to be on you, this is what I'm talking about. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, those who don't have a leg to stand on, those who don't have hope, those don't, who don't have joy, those who might have lost their first love, those who might have lost a loved one. I want to preach an anointed word to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim freedom. This jacket I'm wearing today, was worn by a man that I dearly loved in our church, the Father's House Church. And yet he had a silent anger, he had a silent grief, something I didn't know about so deep that he couldn't conquer it, and he took his life. 
put a gun to the back of his head and killed himself in a public park. His wife wanted me to have this jacket, and I said, I'll wear it. And when I wear it, I'll remember many things. The one thing I remember is that everywhere you go and every person you meet, they're dealing with something silent that they can't talk about. They can't talk about. But they can be brokenhearted because somebody said something. Somebody wasn't there when they were supposed to be there. Or they did something so terrible, they don't think there's pardon for them. There's some deep, deep sorrows that people carry around. But there's an anointing that's in Jesus Christ. And in the name of Jesus Christ, that can wash it away wave after wave of this anointing that I'm talking about today. People say to me often, uh, I ask them how you doing, they say blessed and highly favored, and often it's talking about what we call the American dream. And I'm glad if you can be blessed in finances and in your home and what you drive, but my friend, that's not the anointing. I'm talking about. I'm talking about the anointing that God gives to us to reach out to those who are brokenhearted, who are poor, and they need somebody who's got guts enough to be themselves and to say exactly what God's Word says. That's the anointing, favor and blessing I'm talking about in these meetings. To proclaim freedom for the captives. Proclaim it, declare it, and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That was a year of jubilee in the Hebrew culture. That was a year when everything that you owed was given back to you. It was a, a year of freedom from tilling up the ground and harvesting. For one year in your lifetime, there would be a year of uh, jubilee, a year of tremendous rest. And when Jesus came and John recorded his words, he said, Jesus came with mercy and truth and favor which was, oh, I, I love the translation of it to understand it, that it's grace upon grace, favor upon favor, heaped upon heap, often, often. And my folks at church know what I'm doing. Say in worship, I, I might be having my hands like this because they that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings. And so I, I see myself being lifted by the unseen spirit of God like eagles are lifted by the unseen thermals of God, and they rise up above life's troubles and struggles. And then I'm also kind of going like this, and I'm believing that wave after wave after wave of God's help is coming upon me. I've often stood in a restaurant and did that when the enemy was attacking me and I was losing my peace or going to step out of walking in the Spirit and want to continue being close to Jesus all day, and I'll stop. And often I'll touch my ring. I have an eagle ring, and I thank God that I can mount up with wings as eagles. Now, listen, I imagine the Word of God. The Word of God is not a little hot box that you pick out something out of context. This is a relationship. When you read the Word, read it in context. Read it and read it and imagine it. Get into it and imagine it. So when he said, we'll mount up like wings, uh, on wings like, brother, I believe. I see myself rising above life's struggle, life's question, and uh, energy. I have situations that I have to deal with. We all do. But I know the anointing washes them out, and there's nothing else that will do it. You can get the best secular counseling in the world, and it won't set you free. Any counseling that doesn't have the cross of Jesus Christ at the foundation of it is not going to deliver you. It can placate, it can cause you to have a mood-altering thinking or drug, but it will not set you free. Only Jesus Christ is the answer for us. And provide those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So I thank God in praying for these meetings that I could come into agreement, and I'm asking you again to come into agreement with your leadership and with me that we would believe that Jesus Christ is going to show up here and that his anointing is going to break every bondage, set every captive free. And you'll be surprised how people will not tell you what's struggling with them. When I was a young pastor, we had an evangelist come in, 
and she had worked in a, the red light district of New York, and God had gloriously saved her. While she was preaching, the anointing was so strong, and I knew that she was for real. And then she asked a question, and I thought, oh, my God, this is embarrassing. She asked for the women in the sanctuary who had been abused or raped. And I said, oh, no, don't ask that question in church. And when I opened my eyes from fear and anxiety, our altar was packed. I had no idea women had suffered such abuse, silently carried without telling someone else. This would be back in the early 80s. And God so blessed those women that day from a deep, deep grief that only the Spirit of God can break. I'm telling you today, I'm declaring to you that he will minister to your deepest need. He will carry it away, and you can be free forever in the name of Jesus. And change can come quickly. Dynamic change can come quickly. The darkest day that ever happened on the earth concerning the passion and death of Jesus, and then the brightest day that ever happened on the planet was only three days apart. So the darkest thing that's ever happened to you can change when the anointing of God is in the house. It doesn't take long when you're depending on Jesus Christ. That's my passion. That's my desire for these special meetings, that what you really need, Jesus Christ will do it for you, Jesus Christ alone. And I'm going to quit preaching in enough time that Josiah can sing a song that I asked him if he would learn and sing because this simple song it has the eternal gospel in it, and the lyrics can wash over us, and they would declare what I'm preaching today. So, Pastor, make sure that I stop in time for him to sing. Throw something at me. It's several months ago, and I'm saying this to encourage your faith, Pastor Jerry asked me to come for these special dates, and I, I had asked the Lord, about these things. And you know, as I reflected on it, there's a certain thought that had come to me many times through the years, surfacing and demanding my attention. Then I read an article that put it into words. I read about a nurse who ministered to the dying. And oh, I wanted to read it rather than bring it up. But she had ministered to the dying, then wrote a book about the five greatest regrets that these dying people had shared. The first, number one regret, was I wish I would have lived the life that I dreamed of. I wish that I would have lived my life rather than what other people expected of me. Boy, that got a hold of me because... There are certain things in my faith life that I want to do, I've wanted to do. And one of them was to attend a meeting like this called to preach, but that I came full of the Spirit and full of power. And so my key to that is Jesus Christ. And before he started his ministry, he uh, fasted. He was in temptation for 40 days, but the Bible says that he came out. Did we get a change from John 4 to Luke 4? If not, I'll... Jesus returned to Galilee, and I began to desire in prayer before coming here, God, let me go to New Canaan Crosby in the power of the Spirit. And it says news about him spread throughout the whole countryside, news about Jesus. And so my desire when coming here, I'm asking the Lord, please let me come in power and in anointing with the name of Jesus. And so for three weeks, I added fasting to prayer because I realized that he had fasted and prayed and came out in the spirit and power, and that's how he was able to bring an anointed word to people. And then driving here on Friday, 
I realized that four days of continual fasting, just liquid fasting, no hunger. I had no hunger. And I looked at Patty as she was eating a lunch as we were traveling, and I said, please listen, listen to me now. I said to my wife, I have no hunger. God has lifted my hunger. It's a spirit-led fast, and it's a spirit-fed fast. He's feeding me strength to fast. And if he's doing that, oh, hallelujah, I told my wife in the restaurant, he's going to do something here for people so deep that it'll change their life forever. And so I thanked him for that. And even though it's awkward to be with my wife when she's eating, or you know, she feels awkward, and to be awkward while I'm here with uh, friends and uh, that, we, that they'll be eating, but I'm not going to stop fasting until he lifts it because when it's spirit-led, it's spirit-fed, and he'll take you out of it. Now, I said that to encourage you, that I, that was an affirmation with me, that our lives are going to be changed. Our lives are going to be changed. It'll be by the name of Jesus, and he'll do a work. You know, he can do a work in us so much that we'll surprise ourselves. He, he can do a work in us that we surprise others. And in John, or Luke chapter 8, verse 44, she came up behind him. This got into my, my mind and into my spirit. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched her? Jesus asked. And when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. These words got deep into my spirit, and they became rhema to me. They became God speaking to me. I know that power has gone out from me. And I said, Lord, that's my desire, that when I'm in the churches that pastor pastors, I want to have your power released from me when I pray for people so that what they need they can get when they come here. They won't leave thinking, boy, Pastor Mike's a great preacher. They'll leave here thinking, Jesus is a great Savior. Jesus is a great Deliverer. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. My God, he is wonderful and beyond description. Hallelujah. Knowing these two texts and having my desire set on coming here with that dream to come true. I stood in a midweek service about a month ago, and I said, Patty, come here. She's my wife. She'll be in the second service. I said, stand with me, and I asked the midweek people to come and stand with us, and I asked them, thinking about power went out of Jesus and into that woman, and I was believing that power would come through my, my flock, my band of believers, and a, a fresh anointing would come into me power would come into Patty. And so as they prayed for me, that's exactly what happened. I realized it happened about two days later when my mind was set on uh, Jesus all day long. When uh, I sat down to watch a late night show with Patty, one that we thought was acceptable, as we sat there, I couldn't stand it. it. Everything about it vexed my spirit. And I got up, I said, Patty, you can finish it. I can't stay in here. And so I I left the room, and so for uh, about a month then, prior to coming here, the things of this world have have grown strangely dim. All I could think about was prayer and the ministry of the Word. I like that. That's what I want. That's what I'm called to do. So I realized that that prayer on Wednesday night, the power of God was released into my life and quickened me. And so I come to you saying, I know God can do it. Maybe you've lost your first love. He can give it back. Maybe you used to pray and you don't pray anymore on your own. He can bring that desire back. He's not mad at you. He loves you. The anointing wants to bring that back to you. Maybe you're angry with your spouse and you can't speak kindly, and maybe you're going around in silence. He can bring back love into your marriage. He can turn water into wine. He can do that. And maybe you want to be a witness verbally and unashamedly at school or in the marketplace or where you run and hang out. He can do that in your life. It's a deep work. I'm telling you, I declare it. He can do it, and he's glad to do it 
during these special meetings, please understand, I'm testifying and I'm declaring. I believe it will be just as it was told. And that man with his arms folded and the dark-haired wife uh, next, next to you, I don't know you, but I do believe God's doing something very real for the both of you. Even a fear that one of you has been struggling with is going to be not placated, not domesticated. It's going to be destroyed. Sister, it's you. You're going to go free. Would you stand just a moment? I'm not having you come down here. Brother, you lay your hand on her back. Sister, in Jesus' name, a darkness of fear is gone. Is gone in Jesus' name. And if, in fact, it voices its mouth again, you are to declare, I am dead indeed unto that fear. I am dead indeed unto that fear. Jesus has sent me. Amen. Amen. You're free. Free. Is that witness with you? Very much so. Now, here's one of the first signs is that I get to, I get to walk in an anointing during these meetings. Thank you. God bless you, sister. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that during these days of anniversary celebration, it is going to be even as it was told me, and I come into agreement with all leadership concerning these meetings. Hallelujah. Let me add this text to the message I was given. Luke chapter 24. They got up and returned at once. Those are the two disciples who had left Jerusalem, left an opportunity, left a position left and running away from problems. Uh, if you've ever been crushed by situations, you can relate to these two guys. If you've ever had a dream that you thought is never going to come true, you can relate to these two men. If your hopes and aspirations have been crushed cruelly, like overnight, you can relate to these two disciples. If you've wanted something and you haven't got it yet and it's breaking your heart, you can relate to these two men. And they're walking on life's journey together and they're talking scripture. No matter what you're going through, talk scripture. No matter what you're going through, keep your mind on the Lord and keep your eyes in the scripture because Jesus will come to you and visit you in a real way. There they found the 11 and those with them. I'm sorry. Uh, and say, assembled together like we're assembled together. Next verse. And saying, it's true, the Lord has risen, and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened. This is absolutely marvelous, and it's an affirmation to me, I hope it is to you, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. I want to say that they were walking with Jesus and they fellowshiped with Jesus while they were walking away from God's greatest opportunity, which was taking place in Jerusalem. And even though we're walking away, but our hearts are on Jesus Christ, I want to tell you, he'll turn you around. If you fear today that you've gone too far a certain direction, keep talking Jesus. He will turn you back around to fulfill the dream. Listen to me. The highest point and desire for your life should be what does God want me to do? Of all the things you pray for, you must be praying, why am I here? What do you want me to do? We ought to echo the prayer of Saul of Tarsus when first he asked, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. To find out that Jesus Christ, to the best of your ability, who he is. Next question, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I'll give up anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll die to myself and live only for your glory. That's the affirmation that we give to the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything less, and we go through life not knowing the best, anything less than making him our heart's desire, loving God with all of, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, 
all of our strength. I used to think at times as an early Christian, a new Christian, that if I gave him everything, I'd somehow lose. But I found out since then, if we give him our best, he gives us his better. That anything you give to him, if you give him an empty tomb, he'll fill it with his glory. If you give him five loaves and two fishes, he will make something magnificent out of it. If you give him a cradle, he'll let uh, salvation be born there. Look what God can do with dirt. Look what God can do with dirt. I don't know what your past is, and I don't know what your right now is, but I'm telling you, if you will say to Jesus, here am I, what do you want to do with me? He'll turn your life into a miracle. Let's go back to those scriptures. Okay. And while they were still talking, they, meaning those two, had met with Jesus. Those two had had Jesus reveal his resurrection body to them. And they had turned around because Jesus had put a running in their feet, and they ran back to their purpose, and they ran back to the power of God. They were going to meet with 120 and be filled with the Holy Ghost and turn this world upside down. Common folk like you and me, filled and covered by the blood of Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost, turn the world upside down. I'm telling you, we don't need government to make changes. We don't need poetry to make changes. We don't need philosophy. What we need is Jesus and the power Amen. of the Holy Ghost. And when we meet with Jesus and then we talk to other people, this is what happens. While they were still talking, those two who had spent time with Jesus, Jesus himself stood among them and gave an anointed word. He said, peace. So my desire of prayer and fasting to come here was that when I would speak after being with Jesus for several months, that when I speak, he would show up and he would say to each and every one of us, peace. What you need, it's yours. Your, your dreams are not enough. I've got greater dreams. You know, Jesus is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or even think. That means higher than our highest hope, highest than the highest uh, thoughts you've ever had of what you want for yourself, your family, the church, the community, the nations. He wants to do and will do more. He will take a simple prayer, and as a mediator, he will turn it into a masterpiece according to the perfect will of God. Amen. 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 Son, in Jesus, he knows you so well. And he's here to say he loves you, and I I believe he's doing what he said he would do through the church and through me on these days, that he would say to you, peace, honey. Peace. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of anything. Peace. Be still. Freedom to the captives. Freedom. Freedom. Hallelujah. We need to... We need to pull it to a close, Pastor. Okay. i 
has, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. Now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. It's 18 years and it's a celebration, but it's something serious about this celebration. When I think of hearts being changed, you know, Pastor Mike is 
very aware of what we as a body of believers have gone through in the last, about the last month, and much of what we're still going through. But I believe he came to heal the brokenhearted, deliver the captives, amen, put a word in the ears of the poor, raise them up. Oh, I believe that. So tonight, it'll be 7 o'clock. Everybody say 7 o'clock. It's going to be in New Caney tonight. We want you to come out to New Caney and visit you. Say, well, you know, this is my church here, Don. This is your building. Come on. But we are, our church, and right now, the Father's house in Illinois, watching Pastor Mike here from this building. Yeah. We in a building, but we're still reaching all the way out to California this morning, New Mexico. The church is a lot of places, wherever the believers gather. Amen. I'd like our servant leaders to come up. There's announcements that uh, will be on the overhead. You can see them about what's going to be going on over the next few weeks. But what's important to me right now is this meeting. And, uh, you know, and I, I saw Pastor Mike come in last night. I saw that seriousness on him. Still smiling, but I know, I know, I know that God's going to meet us. Uh, a word's going to go forth. And there are times that you know, all you need is a word. You need to hear the right thing. Amen. Like the two guys on the road to Emmaus. They turned around. Jesus just disappeared. He just disappeared. They, they actually said, you're J And before they could get Zeus out, he was gone. And they took off running back. What's that? Eight miles? 18 miles? Eight miles ran. Eight miles back. Hallelujah. To get back to the disciples and say, look, I, I found him. I saw him. This morning, if you would, uh, not only on your tithe, but on your offering, give a little extra so we can be a blessing to, to Brother David and Pastor Mike, amen, and travel here to be with us. they worth their due, their honor, amen. And a lot of times, uh, honor is, is uh, bestowed upon people by how much you love them. I told you last week where your treasure is, your heart is. And if you put your treasure in the house, if you, you put your treasure toward the things of God, your heart stays there, amen. Keep your heart connected there. Can I get an amen? Amen. As we give today, did y'all get an envelope? What's in your back? Okay. If you give it by phone, amen. If you give it on holywild.net slash give, amen. And again, if you're watching, you should be giving. And just be straight up with you. If you're watching, listen, I got Netflix at the house. I got to pay for it. There's a rumor my wife's even got Hulu on her phone. I don't know. But I promise you, she got to pay for it. If you're watching us right now, you need to pay for it. Amen. You need to be a giver. Amen. Be a giver in the things of God and watch your heart stay there with you. As we give today, we believe in God for? More money, less out. Benefits. Sales and commission. Checks in the mail. Gifts and surprises. Finding money. Bills paid off. Settlements. Inheritance. Rebates and returns. Debts demolished. Royalties received. And success to the kingdom of God. Amen. Now as we prepare to leave... Please don't leave your kids here today. <laughs> Listen, again, Tuesday night. Mary Helen, is that you? Are you serious? Would you mind standing? This is like one of my spiritual mamas here. Mary, her, her kids from my youth group 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. You know, I was with Sally and Sarah Long two Sundays ago. They were out at the church. You remember the Longs? You and... and uh, Trying to think of Mama's name, right? I just called her Sister Long. We're so glad to have you. You still live up in Livingston? So glad to have you here. Amen. You know, there are times that this lady will write my mama. Tell my mama how much she loves me. And she lives up in Livingston. And bless my mama. Amen. How many of you know when you bless somebody's kids, you just bless mom and daddy? Amen. And you've done it so often. Sister Mary, so glad to have you here. Hopefully, you, I'll see you a little bit more. Amen. If... Uh, Pastor Mike, I want you to close in prayer. So I, I want you to stand with me if you would. Pastor's going to close. Because we got to get to the other building as quick as we can. And you're welcome to follow us out there. We'll be a little late to get there, but you're welcome to go out. Amen. And t-shirts in the back. I have no idea what they say. I see life. What's that? David Huff Merchandise. Thank you. So if you want to get a CD, an MP3, or... Or a hologram. I don't know what's coming up next. There's so much new stuff out there. But here's what I like for you to do. If, if you say, Pastor, this morning, 
that I just I, I know I'm here for a reason. I just didn't show up here today. I know this is my church, but I, I'm here for a reason today. And with your hands bowed and your eyes closed, if you feel that way, without you feeling embarrassed, or anything, just lift your hand. As Pastor Mike prays, I believe God going to touch us before we walk out of this building again. Amen. I do too. Man, that's, that's beautifully said. Father, we thank you for the illustration and truth that as they left Jesus, the lepers, that as they left, they were healed yes. as they left. And what Pastor just said to this beautiful flock is that I'm receiving. I have received my deepest need. Jesus is becoming alive in a powerful way in me again. And what I need most, he's supplying. As I walk in faith, leaving this building, I believe that what I need is going to manifest through your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. I'll see you tonight.